So we got the uh, Alpha in the workshop. I drove it back in this morning. No engine management light came on at all today. I did hit the turbo a few times. I saw it kick in. Um, but I, th I can only think because it's happening sporadically like that we've got some kind of sticky vein situation in the turbo. So we're going to try a simple approach first. I've got the old Mr. Muscle on the go. So the boys over at Car Care Centre really wanted to do the DPF because there's a lot of debate on whether 70% is 70% uh, to 100% clogged or whether 100% is acceptable when it's 100 to 200% that is uh, is the problem zone. There's a lot of debate amongst the boys so they've decided they're going to regen it anyway for me. So guys, I'm back on the Alpha for a minute or two. Um, perhaps the power of the net can help me with this one after the help you gave me with the with the caddy. Um, let's recap. The car came in, uh, I drove it, it had very poor performance, and it came up with the code for the boost sensor. So I changed the boost sensor out, which lives down here somewhere, doesn't it? And I immediately got a wallop of power at 2,500 revs. Um, if you remember my video when I first drove it, it punched and kicked like a donkey. Loads and loads of power, and I did a video about how well it performed. But driving in the following day, I noticed that below 2,500 revs, it had next to nothing performance wise. It was really quite flat and dead. So, to the point where it was a bit almost dangerous, where it had nothing, and it was just bang, a big wallop of power. So, on, on advice, I cleaned out the EGR valve, so that was completely cleaned out. Then I had it have a DPF regen, okay. Now, after doing those things, the performance under 2,500 revs, excellent. Again, loads of power, but now it doesn't boost until about 3,500, 4,000 revs. So the boost, and it doesn't give you the kick anymore, it just never seems to give you a, a, an actual punch. It does go fast, and it, it kind of like, it, you know, progressively gets fast, but the boost kicks in really, really late. So some of you said the map sensor, so I changed the map sensor out and made no difference. I've changed the uh, math sensor out today and that's made no difference. We cleaned the turbo out with Mr. Muscle and we've sucked on the pipe and the uh, actuator arm does come up and down. We checked the turbo, it's spinning freely inside and there's no wobble on it. So a recap, we've changed the boost sensor, we've cleaned out the EGR, we've changed the map sensor, we've changed the math sensor, we've cleaned the turbo, but we've still got a situation where the car performs well, but it never seems to give you that kick of boost. So it performs really well under 2,500 revs like it did before, but it's lost that punch about 2,500 revs. The turbo doesn't seem to really kick in into like 3,500 revs. Now, the actuator arm on the turbo looks like it's been replaced fairly recently. My thoughts are, I've had an out of box failure on my boost sensor because I did get that boost sensor code one more time didn't I but since I've cleared it it's not come back again so have I got an out of box failure on the boost sensor or is the actuator arm they're putting it incorrect in some way now my argument against that is if the actu if the actuator was incorrect why did it give me the big punch at two and a half thousand rows when I first replaced the boost sensor so yeah before commenting guys do please just double check you understand that I have I say clean the EGR out, I have replaced the map sensor, I've replaced the math sensor, I've replaced the boost sensor, I've cleaned the turbo out and the turbo is spinning freely and if you suck on the pipe the actuator arm does go up and down. So the question now is, is it worth changing out the actuator for a new one because is it kicking in late because that actuator is incorrectly fitted or it's an incorrect actuator or do we think I should go for another boost sensor in case that's been an out of box failure? Now on the readings, on uh, uh, PT has plugged the car in and got the readings off of it and he can't find any within the readings, there's no fault codes in the car at all. The only thing we've been able to find is a slight, it says that the, uh, the actuator might be at something like 0.8 mil out or something like that, does that make any sense to you guys? Anyway, all advice appreciated, but I think we are now down to potentially the actuator arm or an out of box failure on the boost sensor, which I think is pretty unlikely because it is a good quality one. It is the manufacturer spec one. The map sensor and the math sensor were both uh, manufacturer quality ones. Uh, 
Could there still be a turbo fault, even though it seems to spin freely with your fingers and have no movement on shaft? And we did a Mr. Muscle, Muscle clean out on it. And when you suck on the actuator arm, it comes up. Could there still be a fault with the turbo? I don't know. Is that possible after all those things being okay? Be a nice one to solve because it's a cracking car. So it's a rainy Saturday, guys. Everything's been picked up. I literally only have the Kia left. Everything else, oh no, the, sorry, the Mazda still here, that's been picked up on Monday, but everything's actually been picked up now. So it's just the Caddy, the Giulietta, the one that are being, obviously still trying to be sort this Alpha out, aren't we? The Caddy we're putting the flywheel on on Monday, but oh yeah, only the Kia left. I've never actually been this low, I don't think ever, on stock. I don't know what happened, but everything just sold, 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 sold. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a complete record month for me in terms of revenue because some of them weren't particularly profitable cars but it's got to be up there since I started and um, as many of you have said YouTube just seemed to be helping me a lot of the cars have sold well I think three of the cars sold to people via YouTube seeing the cars there um, I've had someone visit today looking for a car for his daughter who's seen the channel and says the same thing that he watched the channel and said when it comes to buying a car I'm definitely gonna definitely gonna come and see James and um, yes yeah, so again I can only thank everyone it's uh, you know I only put out what I'm doing and if you're enjoying it that's good and if you think what I'm doing is the right thing to the point where you're happy to come and buy cars from me then I clearly am doing the right thing so um, much appreciated as always. I've tried to get ahead of the uh, head of the game for Monday because I again I really need stock. So I haven't shown you Mannheim for a bit. I've only been on Mannheim for a bit. Um, a lot of you asked me for feedback between Mannheim and BCA. What I would say about Mannheim is the prices are higher, but the reports are far better. If you want a car that's going to turn up and it's going to be pretty much exactly what you thought it was going to be, um, Mannheim's probably for you. Um, you'll have less hassle, but you will pay more for the cars. BCA tends to be full with a lot more problematic cars with very basic reports, but they do go cheaper. So I, can, I, can, I do bid a little bit higher on Mannheim because the reports are a little bit more detailed. Um, let me see if I can show you one a second. Yeah, here we go. Here's an inspection report for this Punto, for example. Hopefully this is a good example. So we get... Um, what grade it is, the MOT, whether they've got a V5, it even tells you the tread on the tyres. It gives you details on the servicing. And then it gives you very uh, comprehensive details of damage on the vehicle. I mean, all of these things are actually very minor things, but you can look at them in detail. And then down here, so uh, I've got the engine starts, it's not smoking, it runs smoothly. The uh, alternator belt uh, shows no sign of damage. It says the engine oil is below minimum, but we haven't got smoking and it runs smoothly, so it's just been run low. Coolant level's okay, engine bay not noisy. They go through and they check the transmission, it engages first gear, engages reverse gear. Um, and, you know, it, it's a basic check of the transmission there. It checks the steering, the brakes, windscreen, any lights on the car, stuff on the interior far far more comprehensive than the bca check um so you can buy with some pretty a pretty good level of confidence from Mannheim. i'm sure people still run into problems but i'd say you know you can budget a lot more like you know exactly whether you're gonna have to do any tires or not before the car even comes in um, and you know a little bit more about the engine and and what you might potentially need to do there so you can afford to bid a little bit higher on these and it even tells you where the servicing was done. So yeah, kudos to Mannheim for that. Their reports are very detailed. Um, so you do know exactly what you're getting. If we pop back to the cars I've bid on though, so you know, I've, I do well on Punto, so I've had a little bid on a Punto there. What have I bid? I've bid 1800. Book says average is 207. And uh, 23 is I think the sort of middle clean number for it. But I know 
as well as you might well know by now, is that book for puntos means nothing. People don't tend to value puntos that highly, so they need to be a bit of a bargain. People buy a punto if they see that in the price range they're looking at, the car's newer with lower mileage. They don't buy them because they particularly go out of their way to do it. I uh, had a little bid on a diesel Focus. It was a grade two that on a 2010, so it's a really good condition. Low miles. I've bid uh, 2125 on that. I don't think I'll win it. It probably should get all of its money at two and a half. Um, but again, I don't want to be into it too much. Got a little Ford Fiesta there, a grade three on a 2011. Bid 2000 on that. I quite like this. I don't normally bid on Renaults, but there was a really nice Renault Clio uh, estate. 1.2, and I think that's the turboed 1.2, isn't it? TCE. You might, someone will correct me, I'm sure. Tom Tom spec. It was grade three, a really nice metallic, and metallic colours really sell well, reasonable mileage. And I thought that looked like a cheap car for the money. I put a strong bid on that, I put 1875 on that, because I do think that's a 2995 car. I think they're a little bit low on that. When I ran it for Auto Trader, it looked at that they were saying it was worth more than that. It was an into the threes. So I had a healthy bid on that one. Punto, 1.4 dynamic, not the best spec one. It's not a metallic and it hasn't got alloy. So I'd normally tend to stay away from these. You've got to get them at cheap to make it worthwhile. Now, this one, I've only bid £500 on. Why was that? That was because engine oil contaminated. Right, okay. So my thoughts were with this, putting a £500 bid in it, is I'm not going to put an engine in it. What I do is drain the oil. I put some steel seal in uh, put some new oil in it, put some steel seal in it, because I guess we've got to assume it's a head gasket and see how it ran. And then I would sell it super cheap, as always, totally declaring it so what i do is put that in run it check that it was still wasn't overheating and if it started to run well at that point and it was okay i'd sell it being totally open that i'd done that at a very cheap price sort of like a thousand pound car or something um and just make a couple hundred pounds on it and if it turns out to be worse than that i'll just break it for spares or something or sell it on to sell it on to somebody else who can put a steel seal in it whatever but uh yeah i just put 500 quid on it so that's probably the one i'll win and then I had a bid on uh, Fiat 500. Obviously, you guys know I do really well on Fiat 500s. I'm a bit cautious on this one. The paint is a light grey. I don't know how easy that is to blend in and match. It had needed a little bit of paint, I think, as I recall. I think they're a little bit light on price. Fiat 500s go for really good money. Well, they do with me anyway. Um, I think I can get all of that, if not more, with uh, 60,000 miles on a 2012. And the greys are quite popular colours at the moment, so I bid 2125. So we'll come back probably in the next video and see how I've done out of that. But yeah, for those of you who've been asking the difference between BCA and uh, and Mannheim, the reporting is a lot more detailed. Like I say, prices are a bit higher, fees can be a bit higher, but the reporting is spot on. So if you want to take less risk, probably start with Mannheim first would be my recommendation. So guys, I'm gonna to have to ask you a bit of a favor. Um, now, I'm making the move obviously over to my new unit, but those of you that watch the channel for a while will know how much support I've had from this young man, Lee at Barham Engines. Um, such a good chap. He's really, really helped me huge amounts of advice. And like I say, those of you that watch the channel will know that he um, has helped me out an awful lot with the cars. And he's trying to get his YouTube channel off uh, off and running because he does have a lot of interesting stuff going on there all the time he's always got you know some really interesting sports cars in um interesting engine work and he has his customer challenges as well and one thing um this is one video i definitely recommend you give a watch is uh again those of you that watch the channel for a while see so you know that lee bought himself recently a lamborghini and uh, i know there's an awful lot of channels out there where people have lamborghinis and, and performance cars but this is a genuine story of how someone started with pretty much nothing and managed to build up to a Lamborghini through hard graft and buying the right cars at the right time and selling them for the right money. And uh, Lee's managed to get himself into what's like an 80 grand Lamborghini for like £27,000 by just 
buying the right cars, flipping them. It's a really interesting story. So um, go and have a watch of that and give him a subscribe for me because I'm trying to help this chap. He just needs to get up to a thousand subscribers and it becomes monetized on YouTube, which I know isn't gonna it isn't gonna set the world alight financially in his pocket or anything. He's got a very successful business it is, but he's really taken to YouTube, really enjoying doing it, enjoying your comments and the feedback like I do. And um, I'm trying to give him back a little bit here and help him out. So if you could do me a, a, a big favor and pop over and give him a subscribe because genuinely the content will be of interest to you, those of you that are watching my videos and interested in the cars. So yeah, really appreciate if you could do that for me guys.